I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guests, part two of our crew interview with the Sing Me a Story with Belle. And our guests today are going to introduce themselves to you. Okay. <laughs> I'm Andy Belling. I produced all the music in the show. I'm John Baker, and I was the audio producer to get the sound onto what we used to call tape. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Dominic Allen. Uh, I sang some of the songs. I co-wrote some of the songs with Andy and uh, played a whole bunch of instruments. And I even went out to the coffee shop and got coffee for everyone. That was before Starbucks. Thank you guys for being a part of the show today. We we already interviewed, you know, the, the tech on staff team um, who are there making sure that everybody looked great, that it was filmed properly. And then we interviewed the cast. Now we get to jump into the music, which is the most important part of the series, in my opinion, because without no music for Belle to sing her stories with, you really don't have a show. Well, and remember, it was not called Dance Me a Story. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So let's talk about how you guys got to jump on the bandwagon to be a part of this project. So, Andy, I think you were a part of it way before everybody else was, along with Patrick. So can you tell me how you got to be a part of it? And then John and Dominic can jump in. Well, I was working at the time for uh, two friends of mine, Harry Ahrens and Phil Sabnick. And this is the, the real origination of the, the concept. Um, they were, we did stuff for home video, Disney home video, did all the sing-alongs, not all of them, but, but a majority of them. And I, would, I was music producer on that. And Phil and, and Harry came up with a concept. Anyway, one day, home video said to Phil and Harry, we, we want, we've signed Kathy Lee Gifford. And we want to do a bunch of home videos with her singing stuff. And so Harry came up with a concept of, well, you know, if she wants to introduce the cartoons in the Silly Symphonies, you know, Andy, you'll, you and a bunch of others will write the songs that get us into that. And that would be it. So that's how Sing Me a Story, and, and Harry came up with a name, Sing Me a Story, because she would, Kathy would sing the story of the cartoon coming up. Um, Disney home video in their usual, uh, lack of being on top of things, wonderful company, but strange. Um, it sat on the shelf for a while and Patrick saw it at some point and Disney channel were interested and Patrick made it a whole different show and got bell for it. Thank God we didn't have to work with Kathy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that's really where the whole thing started. But I was attached to the show to some extent. Um, Patrick was kind of stuck with me, although obviously he could have gone with other people if he wanted to. Um, but that's how it started. So then it came to be, I had to record the songs, the new songs at some place. And uh, Don Grady, a friend of mine who played Robbie on My Three Sons, recommended John Baker and The Bakery and said they were a wonderful studio, and indeed they were, absolutely so. And um, then Dominic came in because we somebody needed to sing the songs and kind of co-write the songs with me, and that's how Dominic became involved. And it, I, I must say, uh, Andy and I have been creative and musical partners for a, over 30 years, uh, wow. <laughs> right? And And yeah. it was just... With John at the board and Andy and Harry and everyone, it was such an amazing creative atmosphere in the recording studio. And we were all so familiar and relaxed with one another. Um, and everyone knew how to do their job brilliantly, uh, present company accepted, speak meaning me, uh, it, that it was just a lovely, lovely creative scene. And um, I'll never forget when I was in, in London with my daughter, who was about seven years old, and this was quite a while after the series, I turned on the Disney Channel in London, and there was Sing Me a Story. And mm -hmm. I was able to share all that with my daughter, who's now 21, and uh, at Columbia University in New York. So it just shows mm -hmm. how the passage of time is incredible. 
You know, I, uh, Tammy, I'd like to, it's John here. I'd like to uh, jump in on this uh, love fest as well. The, um, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to get redundant. I don't, I'm not sure what the other team on Sing Me A Story has said. So, um, you know, if I'm repeating anything, please uh, stop me. But, you know, uh, Andy mentioned pre-existing relationships with Phil Savinick and with uh, Harry Aarons. And we had been doing work uh, prior to Sing Me A Story, I believe, Andy, right? We were doing some of that home video stuff mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. for, for Disney Home Video. And so it was really uh, an outgrowth of relationships and trust. I mean, so much of what I think made this uh, show so special was the incredible amount of trust that everybody had in each other. Uh, Andy had a team of songwriters that he had known and worked with for many years. Uh, obviously, he knew Dominic as, as a, you know, a talent uh, to sing the things. Uh, we had done some of the people that made this show were also kind of the key uh, components of some of the earlier uh, home video efforts that, that Harry had done when it was home video. So this was a, a kind of a, a natural outgrowth of, of relationships that already existed. And then a kind of swelling and nurturing of those relationships. Uh, I was able to contribute some songs myself with a songwriting partner who you know, Tammy, I think you know Beth, uh, Bethy, uh, Beth Lichter. This was a time in my own professional career when really deep relationships were developing. And they were, yeah. I think that the thing that's so cool about you know being in a, uh, an arts-related job is you're, you're sharing something that is so... Um, close to your heart, you get invested in emotionally, and uh, I'm going to say spiritually as well, because mm -hmm. the friendships and the um, opportunity to say something in a song, I mean, just the whole mission statement of this show was so cool, you know, to, to uh, take classic animated stories and get the opportunity to retell the story through a song. I mean, I, I don't know, Andy, who, who you know, drank, dreamed that up. It sounds like it was Harry or somebody, but man, it was yeah. such a blast. The other thing I, I should say, if if you watch the show, you realize that it's a musical jigsaw puzzle. There right. are three different sources of music. There were the songs that we had to record. Mm -hmm. Then there was the underscore for all the cartoons, which we recorded up in Seattle at Studio X, Bad Animals. Right. right. And then when, once we got the final cut of the show, uh, I had to do the uh, the background music for the live stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John, I'd worked with John for a couple of years and, and I knew how brilliant he was at that stuff. And he not only had to work in his studio, but John had to come up to Seattle, obviously, with us mm -hmm. and and uh, record the Seattle Symphony. And in Seattle, John did more than push buttons. I, I have to tell you this. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I was out conducting the symphony. So I couldn't sit in the control room and have any kind of perspective about what we just recorded. And I trusted John with my life and my musical life. And John, you know, would he and I would, would talk after we do a take, and John would say, that's good, but, you know, at measure 32, that should have been a C sharp in the violins instead of a C natural. You know, so that was that's what made me very comfortable in taking on, you know, the aspect of producing all this music because I had John there. So John may, you know, may talk it down about his role down, but without John, I couldn't have done what I needed to do. Uh, thank you, Andy. And I'll tell you one of the other things that I, I mean, I mentioned a minute ago, just talking about how much I enjoyed the relationships. I also think that this was a show that pushed us all technically, even though we, you know, we now know that it was, you know, still on some version of tape. So we know how old that is, but the idea that we were taking original animation, you know, and coming in and out of that animation sometimes, uh, you know, trying to make stuff seamless, you know, putting new recording in next to something that, you know, pre-existed maybe. Uh, that was something we had started to do in the home video uh, projects that we had been doing. And it was an opportunity to do that. I, I think we did some of that in this show as well. And... Um, that was that was fun and challenging. Uh, it'd be kind of like, um, I think, you know, going back, I don't know if you remember the recording that uh, Natalie Cole did of Unforgettable with her father, but the yeah. idea of, you know, taking old technology and, and combining it with new technology and, you know, creating something brand new. And that was really fun. I always like to mention to our listeners that these shows and these music 
musical numbers are so important to the educational push that is involved with this show because this show was centered around learning new words and learning lessons through these characters of old Disney cartoons that they kind of re reissued with the show, which was such a clever idea. And then having um, Belle, who is one of the most popular Disney princesses out there, such a strong, headstrong character who loves to read. And I was such a big fan of her character and Ariel so you know having Belle get her own show and Ariel had her own animated show it was just the peak of the 90s it was perfect mm -hmm. because <laughs> I just remember being so thrilled with that and having Belle you know have her own she that Belle basically is able to come back to the village to run the bookstore and I think that's such a smart idea I really wish they would you know re, you know just do this again for Disney Channel because <laughs> people would go crazy I was told that originally they were they were they had filmed in the studios MGM Studios at Disney World and then they did the second season in in California so did the three of you get to go to the set and experience what the set was like and meet the rest of the cast and crew I did uh when they were in California, yes. Um, and it was wonderful. And what, what Patrick did to the concept was really wonderful. And that two-story set was amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, yeah, I've, I visited. I don't know, John, did you get a chance no, to go there? No, no. Unfortunately, I never oh. got a chance to do that. Oh. And, and I was, it was in really... place either, so uh, I didn't see it. We lived through you, Andy. You were you were our <laughs> conduit to showbiz. Yes. Uh, Tammy, it's interesting that you mention uh, words and 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 you know teaching words and different words. The value of words. I I have very vivid memories of being in the studio, laying down the vocal tracks with headphones on, looking through, you know, the glass into the control room, and there were John and and Andy and and Harry a lot of the time and we'd be in the middle of recording a vocal and Andy would hit the talk back button and say uh Dominic we just had a phone call from Disney we can't use the word yellow we have to use the word purple <laughs> and I was like but it doesn't rhyme he said we got to find a way to do it and we would do it right mm -hmm. We did, and, and the other concept, the, the idea of the songs was to make them palatable, not only to kids, but to their parents. Mm -hmm. And I am so proud of the team and the work they did on those songs. You know, you listen to those, some, some of them, and it's just really fabulous. They're, they really, they really wrote some great stuff. And hey, we, Andy. we had a, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, how many songs were created for the series? Do you remember off the top of your head? There were two songs per show, right? Okay. Yeah. And 20, 26 shows. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of work. 52 songs. Yeah. 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 And, and it's funny, the other day I, I, I had made a CD of most of the songs and uh, wanted, I went to Disney Records to say, hey, listen, you guys, uh, this is all done and the series is out there and it's playing all around the world. You know, here it, it's done. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. Put this thing yeah. out as a CD, which, of course, they didn't do. Which is such a shame. You would think that they would have kind of jumped at that opportunity to really help build the fan base. And also, Lynn was going around from city to city. Lynn was playing Belle, and she was going from city to city to read books to the children. And wouldn't mm -hmm. that have been a great opportunity to give her those songs to be able to perform in person? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, there there was so much potential here. And what yeah. a great, like, really a wonderful team and so much potential that wasn't, you know, exactly able to, you know, spread all over the world to let them know what it was but mm. could you guys take me through <clears throat> how you would craft and find two different songs per episode would the script be written first or would this be a collaboration between the script writers and the theme and also for the music team well i would get um they would send me the original silly symphony and i would send that the so ones they sent me to the writers the songwriters and i would say okay so this is about you know casey and the train so we need a song that's something like that and 
one of the writers said, keep on trying. So the writers would know what the story of the cartoon was, even though we were going to replace all of the audio in it. Um, and then the, the songwriters would write songs based on the cartoon. Now, once they were done and recorded, uh, the song wouldn't last for the entire cartoon, so we would have to record uh, an orchestra playing the underscore and also record the dialogue that went into it, if there was any, and Foley, any sound effects. Mm -hmm. So it was like literally backwards way of doing it, an animated musical. <laughs> you know, the animation was done first, and then we had to do the rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's not normally the way they work. Mm -hmm. And the writers were, were, were just fabulous. It was uh, amazing. Andy, could you list the, the writers? I mean, I think it might not be a bad idea just for the audience to, to maybe hear some of the names in case they're people that they have encountered in other avenues. I don't, I don't remember everybody that was on the team. Uh, and I'm not sure if this is putting you on the spot or not. No, I, I can sort of give you a list. I only have the first the, the stuff. So I discovered I had a three-ring binder in the garage to sing me a story. And mm -hmm. literally, it was four inches thick. And it had all the pages and all the stuff in it. So wow. I pulled out some of it. Uh, but some of the writers, like Alan O'Day, Dennis Scott, Timmy mm -hmm. Peppin, Randy Peterson, Kevin Quing, oh, yeah. uh, Rick Dempsey, um, uh, Beth, Beth and, and John, of course, Beth and uh, David Cates and, yeah. and Dominic, uh, David Kinoin and Jimmy Hammer, Randy Peterson, oh, yeah. Kevin Quinn, I said those. Yeah. yeah. Alan O'Day, done that. So, Oh, Charles Bloom wrote one. That's amazing. Uh, he was he was great. Uh, that's basically the, the folks that we had. And there's probably one or two that I'm missing, and I apologize for that. Oh. Uh, I was just thinking, I was hearing Randy's name. Uh, those guys went on to write for High School Musical, Randy and Kevin. So, so that was it. And then, of course, there were the composers, brilliant people that composed the underscore for the animation. <clears throat> my my favorite one of all of those was a friend of yours, John Gordon. Gordon Gooden. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it was that was a blast, Andy. Those were those are such great great sessions. I I really enjoyed doing those. Okay. And my other question, it would be actually for Dominic. So obviously you're recording your vocals after the audio has been laid out. So what is that process like for you to go into the recording booth and just lay down the track? Does it take a couple hours or does it take a couple days because you're doing multiple songs? It, you know, it, it depends on the budget <laughs> and <laughs> and the opportunity and, and the, the time availability. Uh, but I, 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 I must say, working with people like Andy and John, it was so easy that I, I would roll in there and they'd give me a chart and he always had meticulously written arrangements. And it was it was so easy and so comfortable. You know, it's that old saying that Quincy Jones used, check your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. Truly, that was how it was with us. We didn't have any ego uh, or attitude. Uh, so it was all done. We'd lay vocals down, and I, I had complete trust in Andy and John. Tammy, you're a vocalist and, uh, and a performer. But, uh, so you know, being in the studio, uh, when you're out there in that, in that recording studio, and they're all in the control room, you know, you're, you're out there on your own and knowing that you have those kind of people who are just watching your back and watching out for you and all all of us just wanting to make the product as as brilliant and as beautiful and as timeless as you can make it that's that's all we're all trying to do uh so it was it, it a long way of saying when i laid down the vocals it was very very quick uh, and usually on that day andy would say uh can you bring your banjo? Uh, can you bring your <laughs> bagpipes? Can you bring your, your guitar? And, Speaking you know, of bagpipes, Dominic, I just have to tell you, you you kind of messed me up when it comes to bagpipes, and I'll tell oh, you no. why. <laughs> yes, Dominic uh, is is famous for playing electric bagpipes, and uh, electric bagpipes uh, are not um, restricted by the physics of regular bagpipes, meaning they can play in multiple keys. Yes. And uh, 
a, a regular for real bagpipe that you blow air into is kind of has a drone and it's almost always a B flat, as I recall. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Dominic's playing like bagpipes in any old key. And then a couple of years later, I went to produce a record and I thought, hey, we're going to throw some bagpipes on it. And I wrote the part in E. And <laughs> this guy, Seamus something or another, I forget his name, you know, he played in like the LA, uh, you know, Irish bagpipe and drum corps or something, <laughs> shows up. He's like this first call bagpipe player and he looks at the music and he goes, Goes, I can't play this. I'm like, well, Dominic can. <laughs> and uh, I, I had to pay the guy and send him home because I had recorded the whole track in E and just thought, well, yeah, Dominic could play a bagpipe in E. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. So you just put a capo on it. I mean, so I think on. maybe Dominic, I should charge you. Uh, you know, you should, uh, you should repay me. It was like, uh, no, but it, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I digress, but it's just so funny. I don't think I'd ever recorded a bagpipe before, and uh, uh, you know, my first introduction was was uh, Dominic, who was so versatile, being able to play in any key, that uh, you ruined me, man. So. Oh man, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't have a bagpipe capo, but sometimes I have to, know to put a cape on when I play the bagpipe. Oh, oh, there you go. There you go. Touche. You know, recording the songs was such a delight because we had a rhythm section that we worked with pretty much on every song. Um, it was, you know, was it Gordon Peake on drums? Mm -hmm. And Troy Dexter? Troy, um, yeah. Troy Dexter. Troy Dexter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on guitar, Just amazing stuff. Who played bass? John, did you play bass on most of them? I think or I did, did. yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. yeah, I think did I did. John, is, John, didn't you write uh, uh, some, a Little Susie or something like that? It yeah, was we, like we, a, we, uh, with Beth, yeah. With Beth yeah, I remember that. And John, John is underselling himself as he always does. He's a brilliant bass player, and he he yeah. nailed tracks every time. No, I think what we did there is I used one of the assistants. I think David engineered when I was playing bass, and uh, we would do the tracking, and then I'd come back in and you know do the vocals and stuff like that. But no, that was a, that was a blast. I mean, I started out this whole call by saying how how what a big part of my life that was the relationships yeah. that we built the fun that we had the quantity of music i think i built my skill set you know tenfold during that time period because i was sometimes doing some things for the first time like recording bagpipes <laughs> so <laughs> it was uh, lost yeah yeah i know really <laughs> uh, i had to take that off my resume you know so I'm, I'm not credible as a bagpipe uh, person anymore but, and uh, also you, you were there for the birth of digital audio recording I was. Dawn. That's right. We started. Like, yeah, this before Pro Tools, we had the digital yes. the digital audio workstation nucleus, which spells Dawn, and <laughs> uh, yeah. So the, we had a Dawn, uh, and uh, yeah, it was. I think we did a lot of early editing and stuff like that. It's just crazy to think that you know well, that would have been about twenty five years ago, Andy. Maybe I don't yeah. know. I, was this ninety six when we recorded this? 95, 96, 95, like 96, yeah. Yeah. So, you, know uh, what? you know what, Tammy? I think it also points to not only the, the beautiful vibe that Andy and John and I have and, and all the creative team, and we've, we've told you all about that, but also it, it, it really points to the quality and the brilliance of the original animation for all of the Disney cartoons because there is and I don't want to get spiritual or cosmic about it, but there is something there that when you watch it and you hear it, it just has a magic to it. And I know that sounds cliche and corny, but it's really true. And you, as a, as a, as an artist, as a creative artist, when you watch that and you experience it, you realize the great responsibility to take care of it in anything that you do to contribute. It has to be up to that standard that Disney initiated way, 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 way back when they first did all these things. It's yeah. amazing stuff. And Andy sent me a copy of all of the songs, which I will link in the show notes below for everyone to take a listen to, because each of them are so unique in, 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 their, in, in their creation, and I love all of them. And my other question was going to be, so you sometimes have background vocalists that come in and sing the lead, kind of like Dominic, but then you also have 
sections where Big Book, voiced by Jim Cummings, and Belle, voiced, well, also p- portrayed and voiced by Lynn Fisher, come in and they perform their, their own versions of the songs in the context of the TV show. So d- is there a different way to present or write the song it, for these two specific characters and to keep it in their key or their register? Or is it just still handled the same way as just writing a song in no specific type of order or way? Well, I, I remember writing a song for Jim Cummings called Music Makes the World Go Round. And um, I had to take into account what, what his vocal range was. And it, it was a song that basically said, and then, you know, in Hawaii, they, they bang logs and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it, I was trying to be clever with the lyrics, but I did have to take into account his, his range. And he's not necessarily a singer. He's a brilliant voiceover guy um, who used to arrive at the studio in a limousine. But that's another story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Tammy, to your point, uh, that's that's just part of songwriting, especially if you're doing songwriting for hire. Uh, you are required to know who's what the range of the person that's singing your song. I mean, uh, yeah. we've all written for different things for years. I worked for Sesame Street, so I had to know, you know, what was the range of Elmo? You know, what was the range of Cookie Monster? Uh, and how would their voices blend together? So these are just kind of tools of the trade. You have to you have to know that. And if you don't, you, you make a phone call. And uh, the other part of it is, you know, when you start getting into somebody with a, a voice like Belle, uh, who is going to be, the, the centerpiece of your your project and uh, you know and you learn what are the expressive parts of her voice you know where's her where's her break uh, where's her money note you know we call it a money yeah. note where you know you push up right before the break but there's a lot of energy there because you're still holding it with your chest voice you know and so you learn those things as a songwriter and you try to apply them to make the person who's singing sound the best that they possibly can i mean jim also as you probably know would do did winnie the pooh and did tigger and did all those voices for disney and sometimes had to sing in those voices so you're now not only worried about the guy's actual vocal cords and what his vocal cords can do but now you're thinking about what can his vocal cords do when he's permutating them in a way to do this character voice right yeah. so you know the guy who does elmo for example has a really low voice but when he's doing elmo it's two octaves higher and you you learn like what what's good and what's not you realize you can't write too low for elmo for example because there's no strength down there around middle c he's got nothing you know mm-hmm. but up in you know c octave above that he's that's his that's his juicy range so um that's just all part of songwriting and also the challenge of a lyricist is these songs were character driven right so right. It, you know it's got to be the right message coming out of that particular character in exactly. those lyrics and so you may have a great rhyme but it it might not be something that winnie the pooh would say or sing right. <laughs> so you yeah. got to ditch the rhyme <laughs> and go with the character well and this is one of the things that rick dempsey or somebody from his office would always oversee we would call them the character police but the reality <laughs> was they were there uh you know basically um watching the brand, you know, trying to make sure that yeah. there wasn't anything inappropriate coming out of their voice, to Dominic's point. Yeah. Do you guys have a particular favorite song that was created for the show that you'd like to talk about and kind of dissect as to why you like it so much and why my, it's one of your my favorites? Songs. All of all my songs were the ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Sorry. I only did one. Andy, you take this. Um, I think my favorite song, aside from the main title, that uh, I wrote um, with a song called Pablo's Blues. Oh, yeah. And Dominic sung it. And it was about a penguin that was that hated the Antarctic or wherever he was and wanted to come to someplace warm. And I I just wanted to write a lyric that I thought was very clever. It it was probably too Sondheim-ish for the show, <laughs> but um, that's probably my favorite song. Mm. Do you want to talk about the process? Like, what what were you actually tasked with? You said he was in the wrong climate. Uh, who who actually uh, Dominic sang it on the show? It was the voice of Pablo? Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't. Re- I remember the song, uh, but I don't. I didn't remember that Dominic had sung it. Oh, well, and, and obviously, it was a memorable vocal. 
Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's one of the cases where Dominic is the singer had to come in and do, you know, lines like, down where the ice is a white paradise, there are penguins as nice as can be. Some enjoy skating, that's their way of dating, you see. Fishing too, lots to do in the old icy blue. Uh, and stuff like that, l lyrics that you can trip your tongue over. And uh, I remember Dominic looking at him and then looking at me. And going, all right, <laughs> and knocked it out in one take. You know, it was amazing. It was just, uh -huh. just amazing. Now, was that your your natural voice, Dominic, or did you do a character voice for that? I think I did a natural voice for that. Yeah, yeah, oh, cool. yeah. The one that I remember, Andy, when you're talking about lyrics, uh, you wrote a song called uh, "Creativity." Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we did it with with Bell and it was a duet with with myself and, and Bell and just, you know, C-R-E-A-T-I-V-I-T-Y, creativity. creativity. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, That's a brilliant, great one. brilliant mm -hmm. bloody lyrics and music to it. Uh, one thing I wanted to add to that is that when you think about the decade that this happened, this was when Disney was actually rediscovering itself as an animation company. Uh, you know, there had been this kind of lull in the 80s, I would say. And then in the 90s with uh, Alan Menken and uh, his various different collaborators, you know, there was just this complete rebirth, I think, of of the the musical, uh, you know, uh, the animated musical, let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and uh, so we were really fortunate. I mean, so much, if you talk to any artist, you know, they're going to talk about these highlights of their career and so much of it is timing and i think that we were all uh the beneficiaries of this incredible timing of this art form it's an art form you know andy had experience writing film scores and you know had a lot yeah. of experience doing television and things like that so you know it was an opportunity it was kind of like just the right moment in time for his skill set to cross my skill set to cross dominic's skill set to yeah. cross tom you know uh, uh, you know everybody that got into involved in it, it was this kind of magical nexus and i think a lot of it was propelled and uh you know just taken airborne by the fact that disney studios was just riding high i mean they were they were yeah. just you know everything they put out uh was was exciting and it was fresh and it was research uh, the, you know giving a young audience the idea of a proscenium musical like oh here's what a broadway musical is but you're watching it on tv now you yeah. know and, and it's it was really a, a cool time to be involved in this so anyhow i just wanted to throw that in that uh we were beneficiaries of this incredible timing timing is everything well yeah. why don't you guys tell me some of your favorite books that you read as a kid because this show was so or you know, oriented around what you have read in the past, and I always love that they mention books at the very end of the series, at the very end of the episode, actually, of suggestions yeah. for kids to read. So, what was one of your favorite childhood books to read? Andy, you start. Oh dear, um, I don't remember what I had for breakfast, let alone books from you know, <laughs> seventy years ago. Uh, for me, I was born into a show business family uh, and performing from the time I was three years old. So. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to confess that my Bible all through my growing up years was Sammy Davis Jr.'s autobiography, Yes, I Can. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I, I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't much of a reader as a kid. I, I remember, I don't know if you guys ever had, uh, well, of course, you guys grew up in another country, but I, I in the States, we had this thing called the Scholastic Book Fair. And every year, Scholastic Books would come to the school. And it was just a big opportunity to sell books to kids. And so you would have an assembly and a salesperson would be up at the front and they would talk about all these great new books, you know, like the Hardy Brothers or mm, uh, Nancy yeah. Drew. You know, there were all these things in my generation that were so popular. And so you'd get a thing sent to your homeroom and you would fill out two or three places and then you'd take it home and your parents would give you a check and then you'd bring it back. <laughs> and about two weeks later, you'd get your books, right? I bought books at every scholastic fair and I couldn't wait to get it because I would I would thumb the pages and smell the ink, you know, it was just like the smell of a brand new paperback book. And I didn't read a single one. Uh, so I I have to say I was really a terrible reader. I, I, I would every and I think now it's funny. My daughter has been diagnosed with a like a kind of a reading disability. And I think I must have had the same one because I would start reading. 
and I would fall asleep. I would like, I would get, my eyes would get heavy wow. and I, I couldn't finish a book. And uh, so it was like kind of miraculous when I learned how to read music. And I think the first, uh, the first novel that I remember reading, I was probably in my twenties. Uh, so I'm just probably giving you a terrible answer to your question, Tammy. Uh, Cause uh, you know, childhood reading, I was read to, my parents read to me quite a bit and uh, thank God for that. Well, yeah. b before we finish up, I have three Disney-themed questions I ask to all of my guests. I call them the Fab Three. So uh, we'll start with the Donald question. And as a child, what Disney film was one of your favorites to see in the movie theater? Did they have movie theaters back then, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember them. <laughs> yeah. no. All right, let's 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 say Mary Poppins to get the thing rolling here. Okay. okay. Okay, you know, one that, that really stuck out for me and really influenced my life was Greyfriars Bobby. Uh -huh. about, the, about the little Yorkshire Terrier. I, I also remember Pete's Dragon. Um, and I was very, very privileged to co-star on Broadway with Helen Reddy, who, of course, was the star of Pete's Dragon. Um, mm. and, and she was just extraordinary and amazing, amazing talent. Uh, an incredible voice up until the very end. She she still had her beautiful voice. I'm glad and, uh, you mentioned Helen. She was my first interview ever for this podcast. So really? uh, oh, just man. amazing person. And oh, oh my God, I'm so, I didn't know she was on Broadway. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, we did Blood Brothers together. One thing she said, Dominic, do you know what ego stands for? I said, no. She said, edging God out. Mm-hmm. I thought, wow, that's cool. And I always remember that. And she would walk in, you know, as you know, she was Australian and also came from a show business family. Uh, and she would walk in before before the curtain and into my dressing room and she'd say, uh, so how's the Mickey Mouse tonight? And I said, what? <laughs> the Mickey Mouse? How's the house? How's uh... Is the house full? Did we sell the tickets? Yeah, so uh, my Mary Poppins story uh, took place in 1964. Uh, mm -hmm. When it uh, was first premiered, my family flew from Pittsburgh up to New York City for the 1964 World's Fair that was being held in New York. And uh, you might know, since you're a Disney uh, history person, that uh, It's a Small World and The Carousel of Tomorrow were both... Uh, on display they were built by disney for that world's fair mm -hmm. and uh, we had gotten to attend that fair that day and uh just gosh our carousel of progress i think is what it was called it's for ge uh it's where the people mover at disneyland came from and then yeah. of course we all know it's a small world which i think had been sponsored by pepsi they had corporate sponsors for the world's fair and uh we'd been at the world's fair all day and that night my parents had tickets to rockefeller center to see this new disney movie and uh, the pre-show was the Rockettes. And, I, you know, I'm an eight-year-old boy, and I'd never seen so many legs, you know. And <laughs> I, was, I was so, like, I was blown out of my chair all day long. And then this just took me to the next level. And uh, then Mary Poppins came on. And, oh, to this day, I can't watch that movie without getting emotional. I just think that the story is so great. I love the songs. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, and of course, eight years old, super impressionable age, but I, I love uh, Mary Poppins. So that, that's probably the biggie for me. And our, and our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Mm. Minnie Mouse. I remember, uh, Andy, we, didn't we do something uh, for Disney for the Tiki Room in, in, yeah. in Japan or something or wherever yeah. it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. did that. Um, Imagineering hired me to to do the music for that, and they had the they had the, oh I got it was they had a Sinatra character and a Sammy Davis character. That's right. That's right. That's what I'm birds, remembering. Yeah, the singing birds. That's what yeah. I'm remembering. The singing birds. Uh, yeah. And there there but there was a narrator, a, a talking parrot or something, who was yeah. kind of like the head the head lead voice. And uh, I, I just I love that also because of the iconography of Sinatra and Sammy and, and all of that. I think that's that was he'd be my best friend. My favorite character. You know, it's funny. I'm just sitting here uh, just 
going through all the characters that I know and the ones that just keep coming back to me. And I'm not even sure I know their names, but I'm a father of two daughters and oh. I love the new generation of the strong female, uh, you know, they use the word princess, but I, I don't care for that word. I like uh, the, the lead character in Mulan. I love oh. her. I love the lead character in Brave. I don't know if I can't remember her name, yep. the redhead. Uh, you know, those were shows that came into our family at really important developmental times for my girls. And, and if I could meet either of those, I would like to give them a big hug if they would allow me. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I just think they're just such important characters, uh, to not just for young girls to see or to emulate, but I just think they're important in the canon. You know what I mean? As far as all the things that we attribute to Disney and all the um, influence that it has in the world, I'm I'm very happy to see strong female characters. And those are two in particular. Uh, I know there's been more since, but those were uh, kind of big in my family's life. And finally, our Mickey question. If I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? Uh, the one that comes to my mind, uh, again, from my favorite movie, is Feed the Birds. Um, I, I have heard Richard uh, Sherman talk about that song, the special relationship that uh, Walt had with that song and uh, how much it meant to him. And that always really got under my skin. A lot of times when you can hear the story behind the story, you know, or the story yeah. behind the song, it's like somehow that song now is just richer uh, and more than just what it was in that show, which was still quite beautiful. I mean, the way it was used in that show was really great. And uh, to think about um, the beauty of the simple, it's a simple, I mean, the Sherman Brothers, I could go on for a week of talking about them and, and yeah. particularly, you know, the melodies being simple, but um, timeless, you know, classic, they're, they're going to last forever. Yeah. And um, that's one that is so beautiful. And I, you know, I can put it in a couple of different mental contexts. One is obviously the movie. The other is the stories that, that Richard used to talk about with uh, Walt and how sometimes when Walt was having a bad Friday afternoon, he would go down to Dick's office and say, can you just play Feed the Birds? And, uh, you know, it would just uh, ameliorate all of his stress for the week. <laughs> so that's the one that sticks in my mind. Oh, that's a great choice and a great story, man. Oh, yeah. I think I think for me, I, I have two. One is uh, when you wish upon a star. Ah, yes. Uh, Cliff Edwards, who was known in vaudeville as Ukulele Ike, um, and just such a pure tone to his voice and the words, and I, I, I mean, the message in that song is completely timeless. Yeah. It, you know, we're, we're all still wishing on a star, you know, mm -hmm. now and then. And the other one that I really, really dug was um, from Snow White. And I'm blanking on the title of it. But in it, she sings about, uh, do you want to know a secret? And uh, what really gravitated, what, what caused me to gravitate to that tune is because I learned many, many, many years later that John Lennon, was so influenced by Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and that particular song that he borrowed, listen, do you want to know a secret, know a secret. that yeah. she was singing? Do you promise not to tell? Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. He took that inspiration from Snow White. So, uh -huh. it, you know, the inspiration is worldwide and ubiquitous. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with John that... Uh, that's one of the songs that, that got to me emotionally from the characters. I don't think any of the songs that the animated characters sang whenever they did sing uh, stick in my memory. But, uh, but certainly the songs from Poppins, yeah. And, and for me as a kid, you know how you guys are speaking so much to the songs of the theme parks and also <clears throat> the actual animated films. It's so wonderful to know that not only have the, these people who, who have written these songs made an impact on you, but in, in another way, you have impacted so many other children who watched the show growing up, including myself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I see little groups and so many people have lovely things to say about 
being able to watch the show and enjoying it for the music and for the characters and for the books. So yeah. you guys have your own Disney legacy here. Isn't that cool to to think? Mm. And I, I I just wish they would put it on Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, keep sending that vibe out there. You know, you put out yeah. that kind of energy into the universe. Who knows what might happen? I the think time's right said, for a reboot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, Tammy, what you've said about it is <coughs> interesting because the show is, uh, you know, it, it transcends ages and time. It yeah. transcends, you know, the, the nature of the songs and everything. You, you could play it uh, 10 years, 100 years from now, and it would sound contemporary. Well, and the great thing, too, is that f from a visual point of view, um, we're not locked into a, a decade. You know what I mean? It's like those cartoons are timeless. They've already kind of hit the evergreen status. Mm -hmm. And Bell, you know, like I said, was was kind of riding uh, the wave in the 90s. But still, Beauty and the Beast is by no means a dated cartoon, and she's by no means a dated character. So I think you're right, Andy. I think it, it still could be uh, very viable today. And I can't thank you guys enough for being on the show and answering all my questions because music is such an important part of my own life. And to be able to talk to you guys about these songs has been so much fun. Thank you for answering all of these crazy questions I had. It was so much fun to talk to you guys. Oh, that's fantastic, Tammy. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for, for being the catalyst to, for bringing us together again after yeah. all these years. <laughs> It's yeah, really... no kidding. Thanks, Tammy. Thank I... you for having us, Tammy. Big solution.